Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News with me, Labo Daniel. My guest, Maya Hogan Famodu, is an ecosystem architect, driving growth and development in sub-Saharan based startup ecosystems. She's an active venture investor and founder of Ingressive, a market entry company that leads corporates and venture capitalists to enter, understand, and operate in the African market. Ingressive's past clients include top Silicon Valley investors and corporates, such as Y Combinator, 500 Startups, New Relic, USAID, GitHub, and Techstars, to name a few. And in the last year, Ingressive clients have made 12 local investments through Ingressive Tours. Maya is committed to ensuring brilliant people, wherever they are located, have access to the resources they need to build wildly scalable businesses. And today, she will be giving us insights into her vision. Hi, Maya. Hello, and thank you for having <laughs> thank me. Thank you so much for, for coming to the morning show. Yes, thank you. Now, for based me. on, I would just really start off from where I started, mm -hmm. which was some of the Africans leading in tech. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that was evident was none of them is based here. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this is the case? <sighs> Um, I, I know I can only speak from those that I work with or okay. that I'm familiar with, um, like Kalechi. I know that she goes back and forth between the continent. So that's the founder of Zuba. Yes, yes. Um, but a lot of these, uh, these founders that you've mentioned are actually cultivating networks abroad and leveraging some of the resources uh, to distribute them internationally, like Zuva specifically, um, and MindMeet, and, and Dev Slash Color. Dev Slash Color is, is cultivating the dev developer community abroad and, and supporting um, entrepreneurs or developers here on the continent. Zuva specifically is, um, is sourcing from designers, African print designers mm -hmm. all around, the, mm -hmm. all, all around the, the world and um, showcasing or selling those products to those in the West who don't have access to tailors and, and the everyday Ankara prints. Yeah, but the thing now is, and I, I'm really, really, really happy about what you're doing. So while several of the names you mentioned, in fact, all of the names I actually mentioned are, are leaving outside of Nigeria, you are actually bringing investors here. Absolutely. Why, why did you think that was very important for you to do? Uh, it's it's a long story that goes a, a, a long way back, even fundamentally from the beginning of, of my family and seeing those who have lived abroad and those who lived in Nigeria, both entrepreneurs with the same background, the same experience, all of the same, um, you know, variables, the only difference where they were building their business. And I saw um, how underdeveloped infrastructure, lack of access to capital can, can sort of disrupt or, or hinder the development of otherwise wildly successful entrepreneurs. And so Ingressive was founded on the idea that there are really, there are exceptional and brilliant people all around the world, particularly concentrated in Nigeria. Um, and and um, the, the, the things hindering their development are mentorship or, or those experts in the, in the industry and, and access to capital. And so um, Ingressive identified that there are a lot of international investors who want to have access to these you know, fast growing markets. Sub-Saharan Africa has, you know, billion people, fastest growing economies, youngest population, some of the fastest growing technology ecosystems in the world. Um, and so we were able to harness or leverage those international investors who wanted access to these local opportunities um, with the brilliant entrepreneurs that are here that just need a little bit of support to get that 10x, 100x, 1000x business. Um, now we've actually expanded our offering, so it's not just that we're catering to those international, bringing them here to support and invest in companies. Now we're actually working with local banks, local telcos, okay. helping them understand how to integrate within the local technology community. Because they're even what, you, what I've identified abroad um, also exists here, that discrepancy between an understanding of the tech-enabled millennial population and the, just the tech community at large with so, sort of the big conglomerates and the big corporate organizations. There's that disparity here as well. But there was a statement you made, and I'd like to take you up on it, because <laughs> you had said the fastest growing economy. I mean, mm -hmm. this whole idea of Africa being the fastest growing economy, mm -hmm. for me, sometimes I'm like, is it in comparison to which economy? Because the reality is sometimes when you see the way the world is growing, particularly with tech, mm -hmm. and you see, I mean, we're making progress, but we have quite a bit of way to go. So when we say fastest growing in relation so to what, looking how? At Ethiopia, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, some of these, you know, Ethiopia, I believe last year had an eight, over 8% 8 um, GDP growth rate. Um, Nigeria, of course, is, has, has slowed a mm -hmm. bit, but it's mm -hmm. still above the, you know, 1%, 2% that we're seeing in developed nations like the, the US or, or, um, or Europe. And um, 
as far as we're look, if you're looking at the financial services sectors, the telecommunications sectors, um, yes, oil and gas and extractive industries have slowed, but we're seeing incredible incredible growth in these in these industries, um, uh, and which are actually some of the main growers of of, uh, G, of GDP rates in in the African continent. So as we're seeing more people, you know, 107% mobile penetration, more mobile users than the US and UK combined, all of this, um, all of this opportunity and all of these sort of underbanked people who, who are not currently using cell phones, there's just a, a billion people, mm -hmm. a massive market mm -hmm. to get these people um, digitized and, and um, in the current market. Okay. Now, I mean, we're obviously here to solve the problem, mm -hmm. but I think also it's always very important to understand the um, so, um, problems first before we then create, create solutions. solutions. Because the reality is I've always thought and I, I still think that an audit is always very important mm -hmm. because once you do an audit, you don't have to go back to the problems, you just continue to solve it. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I realized is, for example, in Nigeria, mm -hmm. is that the government does not fully understand tech. Mm -hmm. So you've got, for example, some Ministry of Science and Technology kind of in tune <laughs> with the Ministry of Communications. <laughs> and then you've got, for example, as well, the Minister of Science and Technology talking about um, producing pencils. Mm -hmm. And you're like, dude, this Nobody's. is... Nobody's... <laughs> so, so uh, how do I say this nicely? Uh, so the benefit about technology, and one of the reasons we focus on the technology space, is one, you don't really have to engage that much with government or, or any of these big businesses at large. You, you can start from scratch. You don't have to have, there aren't those financial barriers to entry as there are with oil and gas or manufacturing. You have to put in a million dollars from day one t in order to get your business started. Tech, you just have to have the mental capabilities, internet access and a laptop, and you can get on and selling your product online. And that's one of the main reasons that we are focused on this, just the barriers to entry are low. You don't really have to engage a lot until you grow to a certain size with but, government. But do, they, and do they affect, because I've also realized, in terms of policy making, mm -hmm. do they have that much uh, power? For example, there were, there were times there were rumors, um, I don't know how confirmed they were, that for example, the government was trying to cut off. And we've seen that in several, um, a, a couple of African countries where social media accounts had been cut off, mm -hmm. several things have happened. So do they have, they, they do have a bit of power, don't they, in terms of policy making or not that much? I, I'd say the only the only sectors, at least, where, where we have been investing and where we have been supporting businesses, the only place where government has, um, where, has have, where there have been a lot of touch points with the technology sector is within the financial technology space, which is around regula regulation. And especially if you're creating a product that is transacting internationally, you have to deal with the SEC and, and other governing bodies as well. So that's to be expected. And also there's a lot of money being, being made in that space. Mm -hmm. So government is starting to look towards there, consider regulations, how do we monitor um, sort of recurring payments, mobile transactions, things like that. Um, but aside from that space, say you're looking at um, solar or, or um, the, most of the other spaces, e-commerce, um, some of the app-based solutions that we're seeing, there's not really going to be any um, um, regulation with government aside from having to incorporate your business initially. Mm -hmm. Um, in a bid to solve those problems, of course, you have a you have a summit you you host yes. like annually because you held yes. it last year as yes. well. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a bit about your summit? Absolutely. So we have a two day summit. Uh, it's called High Growth Africa Summit, and you can check it out on highgrowthafrica.com. Um, and it's two days of master classes on how to launch, scale, and fund a high growth African business. Last year, we had about 150 international investors come out to participate, about 350 showcasing technology companies. We had about 75, 80 speakers. It's, it's, it's practical, very, very practical information on, on say it's, it's um, somebody who's built a telecommunications company before coming and saying, this is how you utilize USSD, this is how we you know, scaled from 1,000 users to 10 million users in the first two years, et cetera, et cetera. So, so no panels, no just you know, <laughs> standing up and talking about, you know, they can go on mm -hmm. for so long. It's very, very clear, tangible steps on how to build a business from those who have successfully done it before. We'll have E, the founder of Endel and Flutterwave, we'll have Shola of Paystack, we'll have um, a lot of these uh, successful tech founders coming out to speak. Yeah, speaking of building businesses, how has, has, has building your business been? <laughs> Because um, you have a fancy name, you call yourself the ecosystem architect. Architect, yeah. yes, because fundamentally our focus is on 
um, building the technology ecosystems within sub-Saharan Africa, and that means helping cultivate the human capital and helping redirect um, um, actual capital to these markets. Uh, a lot of the, so, so obviously it started off as a, a bit of a challenge when we were solely focused on bringing sort of international investors to the local the local economy, um, the barriers, uh, the, the the ignorance, the questions, the only the only thing anyone knows about is Boko Haram and this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. It was quite the challenge yeah. to, to convince these organizations. But then once we got our first cohort, 500 startups, tech stars, et cetera, et cetera, some of the biggest, most successful um, firms in the world, they could tell the story. They sort of became the ambassadors for the work that we did, could talk about some of the successful investments that, that we had brought them here to make or, or that we supported them in making. Um, things changed over time, and now, uh, now we're not only focused internationally, as I mentioned, but but also locally, and and really building up a lot of our local programs. Uh, one, we just launched a campus ambassador program, so we're identifying a key developer at every major university oh, in Nigeria, oh and then um, a lot of our corporate partners locally don't know how to interact with tech-enabled university students. So we are um, driving resources. So we've identified these you know, developers and, and tech-savvy students at every major university. We're through them driving swag, trainings, content, some of the, the, the support and, and, and free products from uh, our corporate partners, and, and finding ways to connect these big uh, international and domestic investor to, investors and corporations to these technology or to this technology community. Now, I like how graceful you are mentioning all these big names and how you brought them on. Like, I'm, I mean, how do you how do you go about really bring? Because I, I mean, there's a lot of people who are running businesses and mm -hmm. they're trying to partner with several global mm -hmm. firms as well. But the reality is, it's still that penetration. It's it can be pretty hard. Um, I think. For you or for, for most of us or for me from experience, I think once the first one comes on, it gets easier. Yes. Because nobody wants to be that guinea pig. Exactly, like, okay, exactly. For that person to be on, I'm in. <laughs> so how did, you, how did you get the first yeah. firm to actually commit? So um, I can talk about most recently how things have changed. Okay. So we actually just partnered with Facebook last week and we put on a developers conference with them um, last week, October 4th. Um, we had about 150 of the top developers and product managers, and we put on a, a great day-long conference with Facebook. Um, and that came, they actually had heard about the work that we'd done over the years and thought, you know, we need a partner in this space doing exactly what you guys do. This, this partnership makes sense. Um, before that, though, I'm, I mean, don't, now it seems all, all fairy, <laughs> you know, all rosy and blah, blah, blah. No, mm -hmm. it was rough. <laughs> I had no money. I started off very, you know, from, from, from nothing. Um, it was me coming here. Um, my dad is a pastor, not in Nigeria, not involved in the tech space, not involved in the investment space at all, at all. And I came here and um, really had to start from scratch, you know, um, writing Okada, starting from like, you know, the bare minimums. Um, and, and it started with two things. First, um, I came here, no connections, no relationships. I found one woman, Mrs. Adiola Aziz, who works at okay. Deutsche Bank, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and is the chair, chairwoman and one of the founders of Wimbiz. Um, and she just decided to support me. And so she introduced me to five of her closest um, um, mentors and friends, who introduced me to five of their closest oh, wow. mentors and friends, who introduced me, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And that's how I built up my, my local community, simply because there was one woman who believed in the mission, saw how hungry I was, and defied, decided to support us. On the other side, uh, it took <laughs> the first, so two things, it took over, it took over a year for us to get our first tour. I called these people every day for six months. You know, over multiple times, multiple times a week. It was, it was, nobody said yes the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that I, that I, that I push entrepreneurs to think about and push entrepreneurs. You have to have grit. No does not mean mm -hmm. no forever. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. no in the way that you're asking me, but figure out a new approach. Okay, so we'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> and then can you continue later? So it's time now for a short break on the morning show. But when we return, Maya and I will be talking about women and leadership, women supporting each other, um, and basically women in tech and globally.